Good evening, everyone. I'm Amir Rahman. I'm a senior fellow at the Richmond Center for Business, Law, and Public Policy at Columbia University. And it's my distinct pleasure to moderate this evening's conversation. Uh, my work at the center looks at the public aspects of private equity uh, and looking at how private investments impact society at large. And today's conversation is very much in that vein. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to moderate our conversation this evening about a timely and important topic. Uh, to the spon the, to the, our sponsors for this evening's event uh, are the Richmond, Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy at Columbia University, which is a joint venture between Columbia Business School and Columbia Law School. The Richmond Center promotes evidence-based public policy and fosters dialogue and debate on emerging policy questions where business and markets intersect with law. The event is also organized in partnership with the Private Equity Program here at Columbia Business School. We have three very distinguished panelists. Uh, I will introduce them briefly, uh, and then we'll go into the conversation. Uh, the first is Jennifer Choi. Jennifer Choi is the Managing Director of Industry Affairs for the Institutional Limited Partners Association, ILPA, where she directs the association's engagement with industry stakeholders to inform and enhance ILPA's content, membership, and advocacy platforms. Uh, our second panelist is Professor Donna M. Hitzersick, and, and Professor Hitchersick currently serves as a senior lecturer of finance, and she is director of the private equity program. And she's also a Bernstein faculty leader at the Sanford C. Bernstein & Co. Center for Leadership and Ethics here at Columbia Business School. Our third panelist is Elisa A. Wood. Um, Elisa is a member of the client and partner group at KKR. She's been actively involved in the firm's global capital raising and business development activities, including the creation of new products, new strategies, and strategic partnerships across the KKR platform. Currently, she leads the product specialist area group uh, for all private markets activities at KKR. She chairs the firm's mixed business approval group and is a member of the firm's inclusion and diversity advisory group. And the panel has been composed to provide us a diversity of views from key types of stakeholders in the private equity ecosystem. So we'll have the perspective of limited partners or of asset owners provided uh, by uh, Jennifer. We'll have a perspective from uh, general partners or asset managers provided by Elisa. And we'll have, of course, the scholarly perspective uh, provided by Donna. Uh, so with that, uh, let me first pose the first question uh, to Jennifer, representing the perspective of asset owners. So Jennifer, you uh, have many members who are not only seeking financial return, but also have a social mandate uh, as a component of what they, what they do, or they, they may be, for instance, state institutions, state pension funds, and the like. Uh, you've also produced recently a roadmap for diversity and inclusion in the private equity industry. So if we could start off by hearing what motivated ILPA to launch these, this roadmap and these standards uh, and how and why this issue is of importance to your members. Certainly, and, I, and thank you so much, Amir. Thank you to the Richmond Center and to Donna and the team at the Columbia Private Equity Program for including ILPA in this important conversation. So for the benefit of the audience, maybe just to start with a word about ILPA, we represent 550 plus institutional investors, all of whom put money to work in private equity. They span over 50 countries. The bulk of them are based here in North America, but we also have a substantial contingent in Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. Um, when we started about 20 years ago, we were primarily a public pension institution. And over those last 20 years, we really diversified the membership. And one of our fastest growing segments today is actually the family office segment. Um, maybe some in the audience will know that among family offices, you have a, a growing interest, an important level of interest in issues like diversity and inclusion and ESG. Um, but we also have endowments foundations, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, corporate pensions. So it really runs the gamut as far as the type of institutions that we serve. Uh, we're the only organization dedicated to limited partners, although we work very closely with lots of other organizations in the private equity domain. So just to set the context uh, for the allocator perspective that we offer today, you know, why is this important to our members? Our members invest in this asset class because they believe it generates superior returns. And those returns are really critical to their ability to serve the interests of their beneficiaries to meet those obligations, whether they are 
public pension retirees, first responders, teachers, charitable organizations, university endowments, um, savers, our members invest because they really need and depend on those returns to serve those, those beneficiaries and meet those obligations. And diversity, we now know, and I know Donna's gonna talk about this more from the academic perspective, but we now know there've been a number of studies. I was just looking recently at the one conducted by Asha Say and Oliver Gottschalk um, in the returns differential produced by investment committees that have at least one female member. And we know that diverse decision-making leads to better outcomes, whether that's because you're plugged into segments of the market where those opportunities lie or because you've got someone sitting at the table who's gonna challenge the group thing because they bring a different perspective to the proceedings. So that's critical to our members. So it's, it, the social impact is absolutely important. A lot of our members are mission-driven organizations, but not exclusive to that. It's also about better returns, better outcomes, better decisions, better ideas. So I'll, I'll pause there. I know we've got a lot more to cover, but just to set the context from an allocator's perspective. Well, no, thank you. If, if we could stay with you for a minute there, in terms of the, the roadmap that you've launched, give us an overview. And also, please, of course, tell us where we can find it online. But tell us a bit more about uh, the roadmap and its, its structure and its contents. Absolutely. So, you know, a few years ago, ILTA didn't even have any real engagement in diversity and inclusion. And I think it took the summer of 2017 and the Me Too movement to really shake us all up and wake us all up. And coming out of that, we really uh, embarked on a journey with our members to understand what would be most useful, how could we really move the needle. Um, and before I get to the roadmap, Amir, I'll just say that we actually started with due diligence and what questions LPs could ask during the diligence process to really uncover um, those issues around culture, around values, around what GPs are doing, and I know Elisa will speak to this, but what GPs are doing to really create more diverse and inclusive workspaces, and what kind of information, what kind of metrics can LPs capture to tell that story and to measure that progress over time? And to take it a step further, we, we started to understand that there are some, some very specific actions that LPs and GPs together, singly and collectively, can and are taking um, to really advance the quality of diversity in the industry. And so to put all of that together, we identified five broad thematic buckets against which we put together on a crowdsourced open source basis, 33 specific actions. And against each of those 33, we then invited the industry, GPs and LPs, to recommend to us specific resources, specific models, specific organizations that anyone in the industry can look to as inspiration, as a model to follow. And all of that's available, is, is publicly available on our website. We encourage and welcome submissions from the industry at large. It really is meant to be a free and open resource for GPs, again, GPs and LPs alike. And I'm gonna throw the link in the chat for the audience in case you haven't seen it and you'd like to know where to find it. Thank you so much, Jen. Jen. So I'm sure we're gonna come back uh, to that roadmap later in the conversation, but thank you for introducing it to us. Uh, let's turn to Elisa. Now, Elisa, you uh, are a veteran at KKR, and I understand you've been there for 20 years now. Uh, and certainly in your experience or the time you've been at KKR, I understand it's become a much more diverse place, as has the private equity industry. So if we could start a bit with your personal journey as a PE professional, and then, of course, expand more broadly to how KKR is looking at diversity and inclusion. But if we could start with your personal journey coming from Columbia Business School, uh, uh, landing at KKR and thriving there over, over the years. Sure, and, and thank you so much um, for having me today. It's great to see so many familiar faces and, and folks that um, I've just spent a lot of time over the years working with. So, you know, this is a topic, and, and I joke about this. In the early days, I, I went to Columbia undergrad. I went into investment banking. Back then, private equity was actually part of the investment bank. Um, I always get a lot of folks who look at me cross-eyed when I say that today. It's like, no, this was before a lot of regulation set in. Um, and then I went from there um, on the private equity side of a, a merchant bank over to KKR, and um, I actually took a, a, a period of time where I actually did the EMBA program um, at Columbia Business School. Um, so I had a little bit of a different journey, but when I started in private equity coming um, out of Columbia undergrad, what was so interesting to me was there were no women. They just didn't 
exist. So, you know, when, when, when I think of whether it was at the bank or at KK or other places, um, you know, it wouldn't be an abnormal thing to not have a women's room on the floor that you worked at a bank or things of that nature. Um, you know, when you looked around a table, there was never anybody that looked like you. So that became the norm. In my investment banking class at, at Bankers Trust Deutsche Bank, out of 150 global people, there were four women. And that, that wasn't that long ago. Right. So when, when I take a, and what's really interesting too, is when we were sitting at different groups and they sat you at the tables to learn how to model and all the rest of it, they put the four women together. Like, think about that, you know? So I, I, I so whenever I talk to folks today about this topic, we, we've come so far, but we have so much further to go. Um, and, and when I think about KKR as a firm, um, one of the things I'm most proud of, of our partnership and what we've been able to build is exactly what Jen said multiple times in her comments is the fact that we believe in the direct correlation between best in class performance and strength and diversity and inclusion. It is not an accident that the best in class performers across the industry, whether it's private equity or any other industry, have very strong diverse diversity and inclusion programs. And that there are people around, the, uh, around that decision-making table that are diverse. And one of the things that we really look to is not just ethnic diversity and, and gender diversity and racial diversity, go down the list of all the different diversity boxes there are. It's diversity of thought, right? Having, having like-minded people around the table, that does not lead to better decision-making. It probably leads to worse right? Because it leads to group think in a lot of respects. So one of the things that I think we really leaned into early on was making sure that we were leaning into diversity because it drove our performance and that drove our returns. And at the end of the day, that drove who we wanted to be in the marketplace. Um, I also think it's not lost on, on me when I, when I look at KKR today, we're about, I think most folks know us, we're about, you know, $225 billion asset manager, once we close um, this GA uh, transaction, we'll probably be close to you know 300 billion. But when I look at the capital we manage, you know, it's we want to make sure, and I think our investors want us to be representative of them, who they are, who what they look like, right? So that is one of the things that we've really leaned into, and in diversity, and, and I know we'll we'll touch on this more, so I don't want to go into too much detail. But we think it really falls into three camps, right? It, it falls into recruiting, for sure. It falls into retention, but then it also falls into promotion. You know, it's not okay to have all of your diverse candidates at junior levels. You need senior decision makers. You need folks on the investment committee. You need folks on the boards. We need diversity both at the portfolio company level as well as at the firm level. It needs to be the cornerstone of everything we do. And that's what we've taken on when we formed our diversity inclusion in council back in 2014. That was the approach we've taken. And, and I would say we're probably on version 3.0 or 4.0 today, and we've got a lot more chapters to write in this story. No, thank you so much, Elisa. There's, there's much there that we'll you know, want to, to follow up on, but you've really set an excellent uh, groundwork for us here. Uh, you know, if I could amplify a couple of the points we made with, with some data. So in, in a PwC study, uh, it was found that roughly 18% of employees in the private equity industry uh, are women. Uh, however, only 9.6% of senior management uh, were found to be women in that study that was done. So to your point about there being a diversity issue overall, but also as you get more senior, it, it, it's increasingly acute. So certainly uh, your, your observation is supported uh, by some, some data. Uh, and you know, one of the things that you've been doing, and we're very excited about uh, that, that through the program led by Donna, uh, KKR has a case competition at Columbia Business School in which diversity is one of the key themes. In fact, diversity, inclusion, and innovation, I understand, is the theme. Uh, can you tell us more about that case competition and what prompted you to establish it? Sure, and, and I think this is, um, sorry to put in a plug for the Columbia Private Equity Program, but, but I'm gonna do it. I'm assuming that's okay. Um, you know, this was really the brainchild of Donna and Greta. And I think this is why Columbia is so different and differentiated in, in what we're able to do. 
um, you know, both for our students as alums, as our network, all of the above. You know, we, Donna and I probably get together a couple times a year and we brainstorm. Um, now we do it on Zoom. We used to do it over lunch. And we say, okay, what are the problems we're dealing with? In our industry, it, it, you know, at the business school, how could we link arms and try to fix them together? And by the way, how can we get other folks to follow what we're doing if we find something that works? And this idea really came to be because this came out of Deal Camp um, and some of the great work and the partnership we've done there over the last decade. And the idea was if we could actually, you know, get students across, um, you know, the different verticals of Columbia Business School, you know, to pull together and really embark on what today is this case study competition, you know, um, we could have different students pair up. They're typically groups about, you know, four, five, six students. They have to be a diverse team. And that is one of the most important criteria. Like they can't have similar backgrounds. They can't, they have to have diversity in all aspects, right? Um, and they need to come up with, you know, a business plan, a, an investment plan and pitch it. And over the last couple of years, it's actually interesting, a couple teams actually pitched things that we were taking to IC, um, which just shows you the quality of, of the conversation in, in some respects, in, in all respects. And, you know, what we do is the winners of that, um, we really um, have them spend time with our industry professionals. They have lunches, they have mentorship programs. Um, you know, they sit there and get to, uh, with our founders and our senior leaders, actually talk through what the process was like, how it was working together, what different perspectives they brought, why they liked the company and the investment idea that they came up with. Um, and that really builds a bridge between the students at the business school and industry. And I think that's the most important thing we can be doing. And it also, I think, and, and Donna, I'm sure, has lots of thoughts on this, is it's promoting an industry that I think actually, we some of us think it doesn't need to be promoted. Everybody knows what we do. I actually think it does need to be promoted because I, I don't think, I think the reason why we've had a diversity issue is that classes, of, uh, groups of people, classes of business schools, if they self-select in or they self-select out, and what we need to do is understand that it's not, private equity is not one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to say, okay, I did my two years of banking. I went to business school, check, check, check. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm sufficient in, you know, being a private equity investor. You know, different types of backgrounds make a big difference in how you think about investments and how successful you're going to be. So I think the whole point of this case study competition was both to promote inclusion and diversity, but also promote the industry. We, we need more smart people wanting to get into this. Well, well, thank you. And, you know, one point I think you made, which is so important, is when you think about diversity, you're looking at it from a number of different lenses. And even when you're asking these teams to be formed, it's not only individuals of diverse backgrounds in general or underrepresented backgrounds, but rather the team itself must have diversity in it. Uh, and what I hear you saying is that you see that as a source of strength uh, for making the team more effective. Uh, so, so thanks for thanks for sharing that. Now, Donna, over to you. I mean, first of all, congratulations on the case competition uh, and the role it's playing. You know, in your from your perspective, you know, seeing private equity uh, over the years and seeing students come through Columbia. Uh, how have you seen diversity and inclusion change over the years? Uh, what what do you see as the, as the important trends in this area? Well, I, I think I see a couple of things, and, and I want to thank uh, you for arranging this, and for Kathleen for doing it, and of course Greta and uh, Jen and Elisa. This is this is great um, to be able to do this and have this conversation. And welcome everybody. I see a lot of my embers on the line, and a lot of uh, my former students on the line, and some present students on the line. So that's great. So I think that you know, <laughs> just having the conversation, right? The problem that created the the mind that created the problem can't solve it, right? So if this has been an industry dominated by a certain type of people, it's hard to have that certain type of that paradigm solve the problem. And I find it really interesting. You have to talk to the people that you want to recruit and say, how could we help you? What would make this industry more attractive to you? Why did you opt out? And so that's what Greta and I have been trying to do at the uh, at the private equity program is really to talk to people and say, to Alyssa's point, 
you know, gee, why didn't you consider private equity? And then they'll say, well, God, because the guy that I met during orientation said, unless I was in investment banking for two years and blah, 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 I didn't stand a chance. Or I met so-and-so who told me I didn't stand a chance. So we found people were opting out. So rather than sort of trying to figure out from where we sit what we think we should do, we actually talked to the people to find out why is this not attractive to you and how can we help make it more attractive? And um, I have a confession to make that, you know, the, the class that I teach, we kept telling people how important it was not to have to know how to model, but yet we gave them a modeling test in order to take the class. So it was like, I'm like, wait a minute, this messaging is not correct here. So we've been doing a lot of work uh, around trying to reach out to a broad group and having people select in and saying, you know what, I want you to select in, especially if you think you shouldn't. You know, if you think you shouldn't, if you think you should go right, go left and try it. You have nothing to lose. Now that's, you know, I, it's easy for me to say, you know, having had a career and sitting here at Columbia, but you know, if you've got two years and you've paid for business school and you want to get a job, it's hard to say I'm going to meander through my two years and then figure it out. I mean, I think the world sadly doesn't um, work that way. We work a lot faster now, but that being said, we're trying to give people avenues to explore that. And once they determine that this is something that they'd like to do to try to help them best we can to get them pointed in that direction. So the competition is, it's a no lose for students. I mean, they get to meet several of their cluster mates because of the rules and beyond, right? Uh, because of the rules of the competition, you must affiliate with people who are not, you know, sort of in your cluster, in your group. Um, and it really does help. So people have really been able to do that. So we've been trying to get, talking to people, finding out why they're opting out, and then also trying to reach people earlier in the process. So we've worked with uh, Youth About Business, um, which runs programs for, for high school students, um, high, high performing high school students to introduce them to finance. And so we've worked with them, giving them space during the summer and then inviting them to some of our events. Uh, we'll be doing a, an event with uh, one of our affiliates um, about transitioning into uh, finance. And we're gonna open, we're gonna be partnering with our admissions team uh, with Amanda Carlson, who runs our admissions program at Columbia and making this program open to admits of Columbia. So people who are admitted to Columbia Business School and having them sort of think about finance rather than you know, trying to target the people that said on their application they want finance. We're opening things up to more people. And I think that's one of the silver linings of this pandemic, if we can, if we can have one, is the ability to do things like this a lot easier. You know, and to reach a lot more people effectively. So it's been really, been really helpful in that regard. That's great, Donna. Could you give us some success stories from an alumni perspective, alums that you've seen come through either through the program itself or more broadly at Columbia, uh, who may have had non-traditional backgrounds and ended up uh, thriving in private equity? Uh, I mean, it's over the course of the years, there's a lot. And a lot, I think one of the things that I, that I, I wrote down, time takes time, you know, and I think one of the, one of the other things besides reaching out to people um, and, and saying earlier in the process, saying, why are you opting out to also let people know um, that the, that it's not a straight line, like just because you didn't get out of Columbia Business School and you didn't go into private equity. So we have lots of alumni uh, who, who started out in iBanking or started out in technology or started out in something completely different who will call us, you know, several years later and say, hey, guess, never, guess, guess where I am now? You know, I'm here. I'm at KKR. I'm at, you know, whatever. And that we, we try to develop relationships with our students such that they do keep in touch and they do reach back to us. And so, you know, we plant the seed, right? We're planting a lot of seeds. Some of it falls right away on the right ground. Some of it gets blown off. And some of it, you know, it takes time. Time takes time. And uh, your career is a long time. You know, so it's not like you, you, you come out of uh, Columbia Business School and if you don't get a job in private equity, you know, you're never going to be in private equity. That's not um, that's not the case. And then the last thing I'll say is we really we really struggle. Um, I don't say struggle. We try to to let people realize that there's so much more to private equity than doing deals. I mean, there is still that mindset out there that I, I, I think Lisa's shaking your head that people, you know, people only perceive this as a deal vertical and it's not. It's just so much more. And uh, we try to make people aware of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. If we can turn back to you now, it's, it's often said that the LPs uh, have the greatest influence over this sector because, of course, they are the asset owners and they, they choose the managers and they allocate the capital. First of all, you know, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, would you agree that the LPs are, are the key stakeholders? Uh, and, and then beyond that, uh, you've made a very compelling case that there's a return story or there's a business case for diversity and inclusion. Is that something that you see your members uh, leading with or are they leading with values saying that 
you know, diversity inclusion means something to us because of what we stand for? Is it a combination of the two? So how do the values and the returns uh, come together in, the, in their conversations? Are they an important stakeholder? Absolutely. Do they always get everything that they want in a conversation with the GP? Perhaps not. Um, but I think on diversity, what's interesting is the GPs are coming to the conversation. They're ready to have the conversation. So I, I don't feel, and maybe Alyssa will back me up here, I don't feel that this is, this is the sort of issue that an LP has to push. Now, mm -hmm. that said, if the LPs don't ask the question, maybe nothing happens. So it is critically important that LPs are showing up, that they're making this a feature and, and, and not an afterthought, but a feature of the diligence process, which is what we're hearing. Um, but, you know, LPs and GPs have to come to this conversation together. LPs can't just push and force the industry to become more diverse. And I'm personally very encouraged by the fact that I see an embrace from both sides. It's not universal yet, but we've seen incredible progress and incredible momentum in the conversations that are happening prompted and unprompted. So I would say LPs are absolutely a critical stakeholder. It's important that they do step up. But again, I'm so pleased to see that GPs aren't waiting in every case for the LPs to be the one to start the conversation. And that's absolutely fantastic. As far as how LPs are approaching the conversation, are they specifically focused on diversity or is it more contextualized in a broader discourse around values? I think it really depends. And I'll, and I'll just say that when we look at our membership, again, 70% North American, about 20% European and the rest are all over the world. I, I think in Europe where we've seen this incredible progress around institutionalizing and mainstreaming ESG and integrating ESG broadly into investment processes and considerations, we've seen sort of a mirror of that with diversity and inclusion among North American LPs. What I mean by that is where you've seen a more rapid institutionalization of ESG in Europe that hasn't necessarily tracked in North America, but we have seen much more progress around diversity and inclusion, I think, among North American LPs. That's a, a very, very broad generalization, but that's just something I thought worth pointing out. And, I, and again, I think it really depends as, as far as how LPs are approaching the conversation. Values and culture is incredibly important. This is a relationship that LPs have, not 10 years, it's a lot longer than that. It was less fun that wraps up in 10 years on the, on the button. You know, these are much longer relationships. You know, I think most LPs would like to be not in just one fund with a GP. They'd like to see this as a relationship that spans multiple funds over decades. And so you really want to understand the culture and the values of the organization that you're, you're partnering with. And it really is in the context of that partnership that values and culture become so paramount. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jen. And I see some, some, very good questions are coming in, and we're definitely going to leave time uh, for those for the Q and A. Uh, we'll continue, so keep the questions coming, please. Uh, and Elisa, you know, similar question in, in terms of the the, uh, you know, where the impetus or, or who's starting the conversation. So of course you have a broad base at KKR of LPs, uh, and in your experience, is this a conversation that LPs are initiating? Are you initiating from the KKR side? Uh, who is who's taking the first step in that in that journey? I think it's coming, as, as Jen said, it's coming from both sides and it needs to be, right? If one side is pushing more than the other, it's, it's never gonna work, right? And I think it's coming from both sides for the same reasons and for different reasons, right? So I think GPs have, I'll speak for us, have embraced it for a few reasons, aside from it's, it's just the right thing to do and there is a social imperative behind it. If we are, as maniacally focused as fiduciaries of our clients' capital as we are, we should be doing everything in our power to drive returns, right? And when I look at our performance over the years, we've done lots of different things, whether it's operational value creation or adding capital markets capabilities or adding industry advisors, whatever they may be, as our quote unquote like edge, right? That's our secret sauce to drive value. Diversity inclusion is part of that secret sauce. Right, so if having more diverse people sourcing investments, driving investments, making decisions on investments, and by the way, across everything we do in our operating businesses, in, in our, on our boards, uh, private boards, as well as IPO ready and uh, public company boards, 
that's going to lead to better results. And that's why I think GPs, the, the smart GPs, should be embracing this. And that's why I think this is gaining such fire and momentum across the industry is finally people have woken up to this. Um, the LP side, I, I think it's also both of those same reasons. They just may be coming at it differently. Um, and I think that's where there's the meeting of the minds. Now, I think the devil's in the details, right? It's it's not the, the principles that you believe in. It's, okay, how do you execute it? Do, do you put quotas in place? Do you say, you know, uh, we're one of the signatories of the 30% club? You know, the, our aspiration is to have 30% of our, our boards to be diverse um, and inclusive members, right? So what does that mean? Um, we're focused on the C-suites of our portfolio companies and those coming up, right? You know, we're focused on our own teams and how we recruit. And what we've realized is that it starts with a single person, right? If not me, then who? If not now, then when? And this is the me, this is the now, um, and that's what we're trying to embrace. So like when we're hiring at any level, it could be a CEO, it could be a CFO, it could be an associate, it could be a par lateral partner. If we don't have a diverse slate, we won't move forward with that search in the context that it's in, right? And we go through bias training. We spend a lot of time on, you know, why is so-and-so's team more diverse than somebody else's? What are they doing, right or wrong? Um, and I think that's where the rubber hits the road is when you get really granular in this, both on the LP side as well as the GP side, you can push this question as much as you want in diligence, right? An LP can. And we can have this conversation as much as we want at our diversity council meetings and, and all of that. You need to put the practices in place. Um, and I think that's where at the end of the day, we as an industry need to tar start telling that story. And part of what um, we did a number of years ago was partnership with um, the AIC, uh, ILPA, the NAIC, was we really came together and we said, you know, we need to write some case stories, uh, case studies, and tell the stories of, and this is through different conferences and whatnot, you know, what's worked? What now, what model a KKR makes work is probably different than a GP who has $500 million can make work. And it's not one size fits all, but you can take a very um, iterative approach to this. Um, and, and I think that's what the industry is doing. Hopefully that answers the question. No, thank you for that. I mean, you, you know, I'm so glad you talked about the investment process and the portfolio companies. So if we can stay on that theme and help us understand, you know, from the origination to the due diligence, to the execution, to the portfolio management stages of your ownership or your stewardship of a company, uh, how is diversity and inclusion coming into that conversation? It's actually, I think Jennifer's analogy to ESG, and you brought that up, is exactly the right one, right? So think about um, what we put in place 10, 15 years ago around ESG, right? We put metrics in place, and we believe those at the end of the day not only are good for us as human beings in, in a society and a world, but it also drives bottom line results, right? If you reduce carbon emissions, most likely you're also materially impacting your bottom line of the business and vice versa. You know, it, it, it's, they're very symbiotic and that's not lost on anyone. So we approached um, diversity and inclusion in the same way. You know, let's put very specific goals and metrics in place. Um, and every company is different right? And every business in its life cycle is different. A growth equity company is different than a company that's preparing for an IPO. And, and you can go, there's, there's a lot in between there too. And what we've done is, you know, our view is if, if it's measurable and you measure it, you can drive it and you can see it. If you're not measuring it, chances are it's going to be forgotten. So what we do, sorry, sorry. So that, that's what we do. We, we set, we set um, goals in place. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I you know, want to jump in on that and to say, so if, if you're reviewing a company and it is insufficiently diverse, is that grounds for it not being uh, a target or do you make the investment and you see that as a basis for value creation? It, the answer is it depends. And, and the reason is I actually view it as an opportunity. And I think the majority of my partners would view it as an opportunity. 
But if there is something embedded in the culture of the business that is leading it to not be diverse, then that may be a business that we, or, or a founder or a manager that we don't want to maybe partner with, right? And I, and I think that's, that's the crux of it, right? Is it an opportunity or is it your Achilles heel? And that there's a big difference in that, right? Um, and I think that's in our diligence, that's what we try to suss out. You know, is this, is this a negative that can be turned to a positive? And that's something you go and embrace, right? You don't want to buy the best run company in the world because honestly, there might not be a lot to do with it. And you're not going to drive your returns that way. You want the company, you want a good company you can make better. You don't want a perfect company that has no room to grow. So I view the same criteria in diversity and inclusion, but I do think there's a difference between a good company and a company that is severely distressed. And there, there is a difference there. Well, you know, thank you for sharing that. You know, a couple of years ago when we began having these discussions around ESG investing, that was one of the, the themes that came up was how the you know, asset classes really matter in terms of your ability to influence the underlying portfolio companies. And certainly in private equity, given the level of control that you have, uh, it, is, it perhaps can be more uh, effective that you take control of the company and improve on those metrics as you cited. Uh, so, so I think that's a very important perspective. Uh, Donna, you know, in prior, prior conversations that we've had around social responsibility, diversity, uh, and in general, improving the culture of private equity firms. Uh, you've talked about how this time it feels different. Uh, now you feel the, the move towards uh, better values in these institutions uh, has, is palpable. Uh, can you say more about that and what makes you think it's, it feel it's different this time? I think, you know, because I mean, when I graduated and uh, went to practice of law, I mean, you know, I think I can remember interviewing and going to places and, and, and I, I thought it was very interesting what Elisa said about recruiting, retention, and promotion, right? We could always get the women in, and to a certain extent, we could retain them. And I'm just going to speak to my experience as a woman. I mean, this applies, applies, I think, for all underrepresented groups, but I just, I'll speak to my experience. And, you know, you would, you would sit there and you'd say to yourself, there aren't a lot of people here like me. Like, they're talking a good game. But like, I'm not seeing the results. And, and it starts early. I mean, if you're in business school and, you know, in the, in, the, in the hard skills classes, you see no women faculty, you ask yourself, like, what's that about, you know? And I think whether it's, whether it's um, sub, you know, sort of subconscious or otherwise, I do think people feel that way. So why do I think it's different this time? Um, because I think there's been a lot of research around this that actually proves it out. I mean, I think anecdotally, we all knew that people that had, you know, diverse views could make a better decision because you get out of group think. But I now now there is actual research that that shows that that actually can show the difference uh, around that. And there's research done by Jen and her, her her colleagues and others that show that LPs actually do care about it, uh, and that people are starting to see not ESG, for example, which I'll include parts of diversity in ESG, uh, simply as a risk medi- mitigator, but rather as an alpha generator, right? So it's not something I got to do, so I'll get funds. It's now something that actually can create return. So I think to the extent that we've seen more empirical research around it, that certainly has that certainly has helped it. And as I said, you know, time takes time. I mean, it's slow, but you are seeing more and more women in there. But it, it's it is kind of painfully slow. I, when you when you mentioned that eighteen percent number, I'm like, I've got to get in the chat box. That's wrong. <laughs> uh, but then you then you quickly said, and only nine point eight percent are in the you know the management, and that and that's true. It's really kind of interesting. I'm doing a program right now uh, with executive education called Live Online Private Equity. And we have 94 participants in the program. So the program is a, is a 12 hour program um, over the course of whatever number of weeks. Anyway, long story short, it, interestingly enough, we have 9% of the participants in that program are women, 9% of the 94 people. So I thought that was so funny that it sort of like hit right exactly where the industry seems to be stuck. Um, and so we're doing all we can and it's gonna take a little bit of time, but, but, but you know, you have to, the first step of solving a problem is recognizing you have one. And I do think now, when you said to me, what's different this time, is I do think people really do realize it is a problem. Uh, and that that we're still still groping around the solutions. Elisa mentioned, do you put quotas? Do you do this? Where, you know, and, and, and Jan was talking about how you kind of, met, what are the metrics you would use? But at least we have a recognition now, a recognition which will allow us then with maybe some actually asking the people who are impacted by this as to what might be some effective solutions to it. Wonderful. Well, you know, Donna, you, of course, are, you have your finger on the pulse when it comes to students. And um, 
you know, you talked about someone going into an industry and finding that that uh, his or her colleagues don't, you know, they, they don't see people like themselves reflected or, or people who look like them in that room. Uh, what would be your advice to, to some of your students coming through Columbia who might be interested in private equity but are concerned that they might come from an underrepresented group and might not find um, people who look similar to them in at the firm? But what would you advise them as they think about this question? You know, I think that, uh, that this, um you have to manage your time. Obviously, anyone has to manage their time, but particularly in business school. And I think you need to just go to a lot of presentations, hear a lot of people, see a lot of speakers. You know, am I like this person? Does this person excite me? Do they have you? You can tell a lot. I mean, you know, and one of the great things about Columbia, there are many great things about Columbia Business School, but I think one of the greatest is our ability to bring people like this group here into your living room or wherever our, our friends are sitting right now listening to us. And when we are in the you know, not in the pandemic to, 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 to talk to our executives and residents or to contact our alumni base or to reach out to, I mean, Alyssa was an EMBA, she can tell you, and I can just look at this list and tell you how many of my EMBA students are on the phone. The EMBA program is an amazing sort of mixing between our MBAs and the EMBAs. And I really think it is a, it's, it's, it's your belly barometer when you're sitting there. Are these people talking a good game or is this real? And that takes a lot of due diligence. You know, I think, I think there is one, um, if I had one sort of uh, knock on business school education is I think we tend to have people think it's really a skills based thing. You know, if I can model it, it must be right. Uh, and a lot of this business, especially in private equity, it's all about the relationships. It's all about the relationships. You know, anybody can buy my business, but I have to be able to find somebody who's willing to sell it, you know, and, and it's, and it's a tremendous amount of relationship building. And, and that takes a lot of time. There's no magic uh, solution for that. You know, there's no magic wand we can wave and find out the right place for you. But you, it takes meeting people and doing your own due diligence. I mean, you are responsible. I mean, you went to a fabulous business school, but you know, you have responsibility for, for your career and where that career takes you. And so we have all the, re our goal is to provide you with the resources that you can put in the, put in the work and get where you want to go. Thank you. Uh, Jen, back, back to you regarding your, your members uh, and, the, and the roadmap that you put out. So this roadmap, I understand, came out in the beginning of tw uh, 2020, which means, of course, you would have been working on it in prior years. And certainly this year, uh, we've become as a nation and as, a, as, a, as an industry much more attentive to diversity and inclusion. Uh, do you, since you've launched the, 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 the roadmap, uh, tell us about the reception it's received, the, the impact it's had, uh, and how you see it perhaps even evolving over time as as these issues become more and more uh, central. Well, I think the fact that it's open source sometimes makes it a little bit hard to know how far afield we've been able to go as far as the reach. Um, but the reception has been very, very positive. We're at a point now in, in you know, we have a, a diversity and inclusion advisory council made up of 35 LPs. They, they run the gamut, uh, again, as far as the type of institution, their investment philosophy, where diversity fits into their hierarchy of priorities. But they're all showing up at the table. They're all trying to push the conversation forward. And we pulled that group together in early June um, because we felt like it, it was a moment worthy of reflection. And the question I put to the group is, how do we want to show up in this moment? How do LPs want to show up in this moment after the murder of George Floyd, what can we do more of? How can we escalate the conversation? How can we elevate the conversation? The roadmap is wonderful, but we want to make sure that we're, we're somehow demonstrating that these ideas are actually being put into action. And so the council really steered us towards a, a different type of initiative. We're trying to capture GP and LP organizations that are doing the things within the roadmap and what elements within the roadmap are really table stakes. If you're gonna walk the talk, what are the minimum things you should be able to say that you do? And it kind of falls against that same framework that Alyssa and Donna have talked about, you know, that it's that retention, it's recruitment, the retention, the promotion, but it's also the engagement, right? It's, it's how are you reaching deeper into the communities in which you operate? How are you reaching deeper into society to educate them about the opportunities in this industry? And, and I just add a little wrinkle to that, which is it's not just about opportunities um, at, in a career as a GP. We also wanna make sure that you know, society understands that you can be an LP too, you can be an allocator, you can be you know, very desirable as 
you know, the person with putting the money to work in these funds. And so we want to make sure that those conversations are happening earlier and deeper in, in the pockets of society that maybe they weren't happening in the past. And that requires engagement. KKR has done a ton of this, not least, you know, the example of, of the Columbia competition, but being out there, partnering with organizations like SEO, like WAVE, like Twigo, like Kaufman, you know, partnering in these fellowship programs, partnering with business schools, with undergraduate institutions, with girls who invest, with high schools, all of these things are, are really critical. And so we're working right now to understand which GPs, which LPs are doing these things. What are they doing? What have they learned? And how, you know, back to the case studies point, can we start to elevate, showcase some of these case studies lessons learned, things to do, things maybe not to do, if you're really serious about advancing diversity and inclusion. And, and Jed, thank you so much for raising the point about the LP uh, path. I mean, for, could you tell us more about the, the career path, that how someone ends up in an LP institution? And does that have to come through a GP role first? Or how have you seen people come into those, those leadership roles? I, I think it... it it, it is less often the case that someone has been a GP and becomes an LP, although it certainly does happen. But um, I, I just started a podcast series. And one of the things I ask every single guest is, did you ever imagine you were going to be in private equity? Did you ever imagine you were going to be an LP? No, it's not an obvious path. I think people often find their way to becoming a limited partner. We're doing everything we can at OPA to try and create those educational platforms to teach people about this opportunity set of limited partners and what does that path look like and what are the fundamental skills that you need to acquire, which are very um, analogous to what you'd need as a GP. There are some things where there's a bit of a different spin on it uh, in terms of your allocation decisions and your diligence, but there are quite a lot of similarities, but there is no consistent path on this. Well, you know, I think we need to learn more about that because I'm sure many of our, our students and alumni would be so interested. Thank you for sharing that. If I could ask you, Jen, to, to differentiate a bit within the membership base. So you talked about public pensions. Um, and you talked about private endowments and, and private foundations. You spoke about family offices. Now, from your experience interacting with these various segments of your membership, are there variances in terms of how they view diversity and inclusion, or is it sort of consistent across the board? I think it's idiosyncratic to the institution. It's very difficult to say that public pensions approach it this way and endowments this way and family offices that way. I, I do think so within the public pension space, you're much more likely to see um, uh, an explicit commitment to investing in diverse managers. That can take lots of forms. Right. It can be an emerging manager program where diversity is part of it, but it's not the sole objective. You can have some institutions who don't have an emerging manager program, but have prioritized adding diversity into their portfolio of funds. Um, I would say across all of the groups that you named, again, bringing up these conversations in the course of the diligence process with the GP that's new to you is part of understanding their culture, their values, and how they align with your own individual and institutional values and culture. So I think it really takes lots of different forms. Um, you know, Kelly. Kelly gets all the credit um, for everything that she did at CFIG, but you know, really, how do these programs come together? What is their mandate? Are you seeing managers who come into these programs who graduate out of the program into the main portfolio? I mean, that's one of the questions that I know a lot of folks are asking today is how can we make these really work as far as widening that aperture as much as possible to give LPs the best access, the broadest access to best in class managers, best in class diverse managers. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And, and you know, there's a, a study put out by Fairview Capital uh, that found that fewer than 10% of GP institutions are women or minority owned. So certainly, uh, we understand uh, the rationale for for institutions, LPs, maybe perhaps wanting to have a concerted program uh, to to engage with such emerging managers. So, so thank you for that, uh, Lisa. If I could turn turn over to you again uh, in you know your career. As a, as a leader in private equity, uh, I'm imagining, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you've had many conversations with, with folks who've come after you uh, in, in that trajectory, uh, often facing challenges regarding diversity and inclusion, perhaps feeling a little bit out of place in the private equity industry. Um, how have you counseled them? What have you seen uh, as they've come, come through? And what have you done along the way to, to, to help guide those folks? I think so, it's so important um, to really get 
under the hood and understand someone. And I think that's what we've really tried to do. And, you know, I think I always get asked the question, did you ever have, who are your mentors, right? Did you ever, have, as a woman, like Donna said, I, I could speak to being a woman, you know, did you ever have a female mentor? And the answer was almost never. And it was because there were none there. There was nobody more senior than me that I could ever look to. Um, wasn't that I didn't want one. I would have loved one at some point. And, and I think what I always fought through, you know, over my career was, and I think this is the difference of today, is if you could see it, it's easier to believe you could be. And when, when I was at those crossroads at different points in my career, you just believed you could be it because there was no one to see. Right. And you kind of pushed forward. And, you know, the, the spirit was, I'm going to prove them wrong. This is like, this is a bet. Like I'm on, like bet on me, you know? Um, and I think that's different today, right? Because I do think there are people you can turn to and have mentors for mentorship programs with. And what we've really tried to do both the KKR as well as an industry, either through PE Win, which um, I helped found with Kelly and a number of other women, uh, Kelly Williams, who um, started the C-Fig business and then went over to Grover, uh, who's a very, very dear friend, or a, a lot of other folks in the industry, um, is if you don't have those mentors inside your firm, and by the way, there are still a lot of firms that those mentors aren't going to be there, go rent a mentor. Go, mm -hmm. go invest in programs where you can rent a mentor, whether it's WAVE or ILPA or AIC or NAIC or PE Win, or you go down the list, SEO, like go down, there are lots of different ones. Go rent a mentor. Be a mentor and create networks like Columbia where you can go have those partnerships created. And I think that's what's great about the case study competition is that's another example of doing that. Um, I've also spent a lot of time with the folks who work for me at, at other parts of the firm who don't work with me. Donna mentioned something very, um, in one of her comments earlier, which I think is so important, is that it's a lot easier to get diverse talent in. It's really hard to keep them. And what we've spent a lot of our time trying to understand is when diverse talent has opted out at different parts of their career, why have those moments happened? And how can we put you know, things around them to make sure that doesn't happen going forward? Um, mentorship is probably a very big piece of it, okay? The other big piece of it is creating a culture at a firm. You know, one of the things I always tell folks that I, I work with and mentor is be unapologetic. Don't assimilate, don't acculturate. Like, yes, you, you might need to acculturate in like how you run your model or how you prepare your investment committee case or things like that, but don't be who you're not because being unauthentic is the worst thing you could be in this world. Be unapologetic. And early in my career, like, you know, I did a lot of things, how I dressed, things I talked about at lunch, right? You know, if the guys wanted to talk about sports, you know what? I made sure on Sunday, Monday mornings, I read everything there was, uh, you know, on the sports column, which is mm. crazy in hindsight. Um, you know, now I have boys that that's all they talk about. And I know more about sports than I ever thought I would ever know. But, you know, it, it's one of those things though, that today I think we are allowing, and I hope we are as an industry, allowing the people who opt into the industry to be more authentic and be who they are. And we're embracing that as an industry. And then the final piece is, you know, trying to understand what are those crossroad moments that people say, you know what, life's too short. I don't want to do this anymore. And it's typically in moments where things are happening in their lives, right? It's a parent is sick and aging. Um, they're having children. They mm -hmm. want to go for an MBA or go for some other type of higher ed degree. Things like that are happening in their lives. That they, Or by the way, this is another big one of the last five years, that they're not, while they like what they do, they want something that has higher purpose and higher meaning. Um, and driving returns don't, doesn't cut it anymore. Um, they wanna do something that has social impact associated with and is really gonna make a difference in this world. So what we've done is we've changed, we've changed the game. We've changed the mousetrap. Um, we have a caregiver program. We have an adoption program where we help actually sponsor and pay for your adoption. We have, we've extended our, our parental leave. We don't call it maternity leave. We want both parents to take that. 
the, if a father is or a mother is the primary caregiver, they should get the same leave. And we actually try to make sure that that is, you know, gender agnostic. Um, we, we right now, this is a great example of what we're going through in the middle of COVID is do our professionals have the resources they need to get through the day? Mm -hmm. We're helping augment childcare. We're helping augment, um, elder care, right? Those are the things that really matter at the end of the day. And if we can help fix those problems in life, we're going to hold on to that talent. And that's the key. Though, though if we can try to make those stressful precipice type moments um, be de-escalated, then then it all works. And and I, I think those are that that's some of what we've done. Not everybody's doing that, but that's what we've done. Well, well, you know, Elisa, the the fact that those uh, support mechanisms may be more important for underrepresented segments of the workforce is, is so important. Uh, especially, you know, uh, if women are the primary caregivers and they need that support, uh, I think it's very important that you've highlighted that. Um, so thank you for, for, you know, sharing some of those best practices. In fact, that's one of the questions that will come to, and you've already begun answering, are some of the concrete best practices. So thanks, Elisa, for, for doing that. Uh, Donna, before... Before we go to the Q&A, I wanted to, to turn it over to you uh, again in terms of the students uh, that you're seeing in and, uh, and also uh, the alumni uh, in the industry. Uh, and so do, do you find when you hear back uh, today uh, from the recent alumni, uh, do you hear them describing a, a different type of industry from what uh, you may have seen uh, five to 10 years ago? Or is there still a, a long way to go? Well, I mean, I think there is still still a way to go, but I mean, I think that they have seen changes and I think that they are, you know, we create change agents, right? So they may have gone into one industry, but we have, we have inculcated in them the ideas that things can be different and that they can be the carriers of that difference. They can be the, you know, they can be the change they want to see, right? I mean, we can all sit around and say, this is horrible, this is horrible, this should change. Be the change you want to see. And we are able to by having our programming, Greta has done a great job at this too, is we, we demand something of our students as well. I mean, we ask them on our application to the private equity program, are you willing to work with SEO? We don't say you have to, but if you're not even like willing to entertain the idea of uh, working with SEO, then, you know, maybe this is not the right place for you, you know? So we're trying to inculcate in them this idea of sort of giving back and, and something more than, it's not all just about them. And it's hard. Listen, I, I, you know, business school is a heck of a lot more expensive than when I graduated from Columbia Business School. Let me tell you something. It's a lot more on the line than than when I went. Right? I went for a nice two years, and if it didn't work out, I was going back to Scadden, and it wasn't breaking the bank. And you know, it's a it's a much more rough and tumble place, and the economy is in a very different place now. So I am not, I am not casting stones at anybody, but I'm just saying that it's hard. We're trying to at least open up that door, that you know. <sighs> Actually, it's kind of paradoxical by sort of helping other people, you help yourself, you know, and that's as opposed to just, you know, I've got to get there, right? By by opening the door and widening your circle and doing stuff that's outside of your comfort zone, you're actually, you know, helping yourself more than you know. And so that's what we're trying to try to get uh, get along. And so we have a very mixed class this year of of people that have very different levels of private equity experience. And and one of the messages that we clearly conveyed is that, you know, we're all going to get there together. If you know more about one particular area than somebody else, you know, you're going to be evaluated on how you bring that person along. Because that that's indeed what you're doing in the industry, right? It's not, it is, it's much more uh, of a team sport, I think, than people believe. You have to rely on other people. And, you know, if, 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 People, there's other research, you know, that suggests that people work with people they like. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, that sounds crazy, right? It's a PhD in the obvious, but there's actually research that that bears that out. And you know, be one of those people. Be be a person that other people want to work with. People, I believe, fundamentally want to help other people. You know, you just have to, you have to just tap that um, that resource um, from people. And we live in such a fast-paced world that I think sometimes people kind of forget that. So. Um, we're trying our best to make that that possible. And the Columbia Business School students, um, I think bar none, exemplify that when given the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Donna. We're at the top of the hour. So I'm going to start uh, looking at the questions or I've been analyzing the questions. I'll start posing them uh, and uh, you know, rephrasing and repositioning some of them to combine. And there's a theme around metrics. Uh, and Jen, certainly your work at ELPA has been uh, very much, uh, you know, 
focused on providing concrete actions as well as metrics. So if I if I have captured this correctly, there were five areas uh, of engagement and then 33 actions uh, that uh, came out in the roadmap. I presume there are metrics for each of these uh, 33. So I uh, would love to hear more on that. And also, if I may add a question on top of that, if an LP or a member of ILPA is using this roadmap and they're assessing various managers and they find those managers deficient, uh, what what is the recommended course of action? Is it to try to influence uh, the GPs to, to become more diverse? Is it to decline that opportunity? So how, how are you asking or how are you suggesting your members apply these metrics? But also please tell us more if you can, as there's been a, a few questions about metrics. Well, well, I'll say the roadmap is um, coming from a place of positive, not punitive. And, and it's not meant to be prescriptive. It was never meant to be a scorecard, it was meant to be an aggregation of organized resources and specific actions to serve the wider industry. So some of the things are binary. And just to pull out the SEO example, because it's come up a few times, you know, in terms of the industry engagement in acting to promote diversity more broadly and reach um, constituents that are underserved, underrepresented in our industry. You do or you do not. We're not gonna grade you on the quality of your engagement with SEO, it's a do or do not. So some of these things are very binary. And it's a question of, I, I hate to use checklists, but you know there are, there are a number of things that you can do. Hopefully it's cumulative. Hopefully that list builds over time. Hopefully you have metrics against which you can assess yourself, your organization and your own progress against goals. Um, it, it's, I, I would say the metric, specific metric that LPs have started with is tell me about your team. Some LPs have started to ask about portfolio company diversity, which Alyssa referenced. But the first step is tell me about your team. And not being diverse isn't a deal killing conversation. It's, a be it's the beginning of a conversation. So if you're not a diverse team, if you're a small team, you don't have that many spots to even fill, you don't have a lot of opportunities for a pipeline of juniors that you can really move up the ranks, you may not look all that diverse today. And that's okay. But being honest about that, being intentional and authentic, to go back to another word in this conversation, about what you're going to do to change that, demonstrating that commitment to your LPs, that's great. And know that for your LPs that really care about this, for whom it is a real marker, again, of commitment, of culture, of values, of alignment, they're going to ask you about it again. They might ask you about it in 12 months' time. They might not really go deep on it with you until you're raising your next fund and they're considering whether they want to come along with you. They're going to ask. And so the way in which an LP evaluates that progress and those metrics, it's numbers in part. It's what's the diversity on the team and how are you changing that? Who are, what, is, what do your hires look like? What does your retention look like in terms of diversity by gender or by racial and ethnic diversity? That's not the only metric. Mm. No, th thank you. And, and Elisa, the, you know, there have been some questions about best practices, and clearly you cited a few, uh, of course, the case competition, and I should highlight that tomorrow is the case competition, so Elisa will be uh, partaking in that tomorrow. Uh, so that's one of them. Uh, but I want to go back to something perhaps more, more fundamental, which is uh, the firm's inclusion and diversity advisory group, uh, which uh, you're a member of. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how this came about and how you know, this itself may be a best practice for firms to, to adopt. Absolutely. So we, we started this a number of years ago. Um, we really started to formalize our efforts back in 2014, um, as I said earlier, um, which I think probably what Jen will know better. It was on the earlier side of the industry's movement in this, um, which is um, honestly somewhat absurd to think about that. Um, but what we did was we said, it can't just be made, by the way, the council can't just be made of diverse people. That doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. We need supporters of the diversity that look like the majority, mm -hmm. right? So this needs to be from all functions of the firm. This needs to be um, folks who are the majority as well as the, the underrepresented groups. And we need to come together and lay out what is a very, we have this on our website, it's all public, a very formalized plan. 
in those three, you know, based on those three verticals, the, the recruiting, the retention, and then the promoting. And we need to do it internally and we need to do it externally. So it needs to be within KKR, but then it also needs to be within our companies as well. And what we do is um, we, we have um, a diversity um, council, um, and then we also have a broader advisory group um, that's made of people all throughout the firm. And we have um, broad-based topics that people are staffed on, like you'd be staffed on a, a deal. Um, one is partnerships with outside organizations. It's not lost on us that one of our co-presidents was one of the, the SEO scholars. Joe Bay was an SEO scholar, right? Um, Henry, chair, Henry Kravis chairs the board of SEO. Um, hence, we built that partnership and really built out the alternatives program that SEO has today. Um, did a very similar, uh, did similar work with Twigo, did similar work with a number of women's organizations. Um, so those are examples. Worked with a number of our limited partners. Um, for instance, with folks like the New York Common State uh, Retirement System or um, folks like Texas Teachers and others who have large diversity and New York City is another one, have large um, emerging manager conferences um, and was part of those so we can meet more people, right? If you have hundreds, if not a couple thousand people in a room um, working with a lot of these limited partners, um, you can find some great talent there. Right, so we really tried to break the mold in how we thought about these topics, understanding that we didn't have all the answers and we were gonna have to partner our way to greatness um, and work hand in, in hand with the folks who we thought were leaders in the industry in a lot of different areas. Um, so I think that that's how, we, that's how we've approached it and it's gotten, it's evolved over time, right? And have you learned from your portfolio companies? We have um, in, in a in a great in a great way. Um, we actually have um, conferences every year, um, you know, around the diversity of our portfolio companies to bring our diverse talent at different companies together. Um, so they can also learn from each other. We're not just learning from them, but they're learning from each other. What are the best practices? Um, and and I think one of the things that we really have focused on, and some of the things that we've learned from our portfolio companies, is that um, I think Donna Donna was saying this earlier. Um, being open to untraditional career paths, right? Not, the two plus two doesn't always have to equal four. Sometimes it actually equals five. Um, and making sure that you have your eyes open for that. And I actually think portfolio companies are much more open to that than private equity firms, which is a, a, it's a almost mind-boggling statement to make. Um, so I think those are some of the, the, the things that we've learned. Um, and hopefully we're passing that on in some of the networking that we've been able to create. Okay, well, Lisa, I will stay with you for, for one more question, if I may, uh, which I think is an insightful one regarding the fact that it's, it's common or in, in private equity for GPs to invest together in, in consortia to enter transactions with their peer institutions. Uh, have you seen uh, practices where KKR or others might look to partner with firms that are either minority owned or, or otherwise meet a, a diversity criterion uh, to bring them into the fold of your consortia. Is that something that you've that you've observed? Sure. So I think first of all, we um, we at KKR are always we want to partner with best in class talent, um, regardless, like whatever that looks like. Um, we do less consortia deals um, because of the fact that we have a very large balance sheet. We have a 20 plus billion dollar balance sheet. And that allows us to take on risk of, tra of much larger transactions than maybe we could execute on our own um, through our funds. And what we do is we actually bring in our investors. Um, so we bring in the public pension plans, the sovereign wealth funds, the insurance companies, the endowments, foundation, uh, foundations, families, et cetera, to actually invest in the deal alongside us directly rather than bringing in um, other GPs in a lot of cases. Um, we think it just makes cleaner ownership and it's honestly what our limited partners want and what they expect when they invest with KKR. Um, there are moments though, and there are instances though, where we, we will partner with other organizations um, if we believe they're bringing something to the table that's important to the characteristics of the deal. 
we're not going to go partner with someone just to check a box. I think Jen said that earlier. Like you can do that. There's the letter of the law and then the spirit of the law. <laughs> that might check the letter of the law box, but you need to be able to embrace diversity more than just checking a box. Um, so if we believe somebody can bring something to the table that's very unique, like so for instance, um, you know, looking at some of the companies that we do business with, do they have diversified suppliers? Right. Who are are, they, are their diversified line managers at the factory? Is there diversity in not just the senior most um, C-suite offices, but what does diversity look like across across the whole business? That's what we're looking at. And we may partner at different levels of the business itself rather than bringing in, for instance, another GP that checks a box. Great. No, thank you. Uh, Donna, you know, you, of course, wear multiple hats uh, at the business school. And one of them is at, at the uh, Sanford Center for Leadership and Ethics uh, at the business school. Um, can you speak from an ethical perspective? And there was a, a very um, uh, profound question, I believe from one of your students, in fact, about whether, should we need research? Do we need to have a business case to support diversity? Or would, would it simply be enough that it's the right thing to do or it's a matter of principle? So in your, from your perspective as, as someone who thinks deeply about business ethics, can you comment on how diversity and inclusion relate to it? I, mean, I think the question, just to, to go back from it, I think the question was, why is it different this time? I've always believed, and I think a lot of people have believed that you know, diversity is the right thing to do. I mean, treating people equally and with respect, uh, respective of, irrespective of their backgrounds is always the right thing to do. We don't need research to tell us that. I think the question came as, why is it different this time? What seems to be the compelling case? And I've seen more than one uh, poll, uh, Prequent sent out a poll to its uh, managers saying, you know, looking from 2017, I think, to 2019, about how people view ESG and, and diversity and inclusion was, was part of ESG. Um, and again, not seeing it as just a risk mitigator, but seeing it as an alpha generator. So that was really the point of my, point of my comment. Um, I, I do believe that, any, and that's why I go back to you need to do your due diligence. You need to meet with the people. It's not enough to see people like you. You can feel it. I mean, you, when you sit down and you really talk to people and you do due diligence, you really get a sense of, is this the place where I feel that people are treated equally, where I feel that I'm not just going to get in the door and be a number here, that I will be promoted, I will be treated fairly. And you know it's important to it's important to to do that due diligence. In fact, uh, that's the due diligence you'll be doing before you make an investment. So the biggest investment you make, hello, is in yourself. So uh, you know it's fine to go driving returns, as Elisa said, for other people, which requires great due diligence on the companies you're investing in. But before you invest your human capital, you know value yourself enough to do the same type of due diligence. And, and we have amazing resources here at the university for you, for you to do that. Um, you know, just talking to somebody that works at the firm, having a cup of coffee with them and saying, you know, I, I got a weird feeling, or I really like that person. They really seemed interesting. They really seemed, you know, you, you, you're going to be putting in a lot of hours at this place, whatever that place may be. And you want to make sure that you feel comfortable. And the only way to do that is not by looking at pitch book and seeing how many deals they've done or, or looking at their scorecard of best places to work at. It's by meeting the people. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank, uh, thanks. So, and I, I love that. I mean, the, the biggest investment you make is in yourself. Profound. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. You know, there was a question, Elise, I don't know if you can see it uh, in the chat uh, that's more personal to you about your own career. Uh, if you'd like, I can read it out, uh, which says a question for Lisa. I only read elsewhere that you that your way, that finding your way at KKR was not easy. Would you talk more about your conviction back then and who supported your vision? Thank you. Um, sh sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, I I joined KKR. We were still really small. I think we were thirty five people um, on the executive side when I joined. Um, back in the early 2000s. And when you think about where we were then and where we are now, um, I didn't want a traditional job. Um, and I think this goes back to what Donna was talking about earlier. There are a lot of different things you can do on, in and around private equity. There's, it's not one size fits all. Now, what I had done for a long time was one size fits all, but I didn't want to do that going forward. And what I wanted to do was help build our industry. Um, I wanted to, I always said, I wanted to figure out who KKR wanted to be when we grew up. Um, what were the businesses we can grow into? What were the different products that we could go raise? 
Um, we had a lot of really interesting deals and ideas that sat on the cutting room floor because we didn't have the right pools of capital to access them. So I wanted to go figure that out, right? We were fighting for a 3% piece of an asset allocation. And if you made private equity look, or, you know, you wrap it, you put a coupon on it, all of a sudden it looks like a bond. It could sit in a fixed income portfolio. If you go create liquid alts, it could sit in a 401k portfolio. And all of a sudden you're playing in the public equities bucket. Like, that's what I wanted to go do. I wanted to be a mad scientist a little bit, right? And go dream. And I talked to a lot of our competitors. I, I talk, you can go down the list. Um, if you look at some of them still exist today, some of them don't exist anymore. Um, and most of them thought I was crazy. Most of them <laughs> said like, that's interesting. I never thought of that. Or you know what? We've thought about that too, but yeah, we don't have a job for you. Or do you want to join the consumer group? Or how about retail? Have you ever done any retail deals? Why don't you come on and do that? Um, and I said, listen, that's not what I want to do. And then I came to KKR. I, the way I found my way into KKR was I sent a blind resume and a pitch book that I created um, to Henry mm -hmm. Krauss. And I sent it to Henry and I sent it to one of the other senior partners. And on the same day, I got a beautifully written email from, or not even email, it was, a, it was long before email was used the way we use email today. It was a letter that he signed that said, thank you so much, very interesting ideas, but we don't have a spot for you today. One of his other partners called me up and said, what are you doing tomorrow? Would you be able to come in and have a coffee? And I, I met everybody at the firm over the next several weeks. They said, listen, we have no idea if there's a role for you to do this. We hire best in class athletes. We think you can do a lot of different things. We're going to bet on you, bet on us. Mm -hmm. And I joined. And, you know, Henry jokes. And when I made partner, the letter was framed and it's in my office. And, you know, he's like, you know, this should be a good reminder that you can never always pick the best talent. Like I, I almost missed you. Um, you know, so anyways, but I think what was great about this and speaking to that question was there were people along the way who believed in me. And as I was investing in the firm and diligencing the firm, as Donna said, they were diligencing me and they realized, you know, what was more important wasn't skill sets, wasn't, and, and I checked a lot of those boxes, right? Like I did all the things that they would have expected me to have done at that point, but it was more about the person than it was about anything else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is go build relationships. Um, and those relationships will be more valuable for you than anything else you do. Thank you. So I'll take one more of the questions from the from the chat, and then we'll do one closing round for any reflections, comments that our, our panelists might want to share. Uh, so th there's a question here that I want to direct to Jen, um, because I, it may or you might want to link this to manager selection. Uh, and it says, for firms without an institutional HR department, what are the best ways to influence them to broaden search for candidates when sometimes these hiring managers give up early uh, after giving a bit, a, bit of, a bit of credence to the pipeline problem myth? So I think this is, of course, a question for GPs, but perhaps also from an LP perspective. Uh, is there, uh, you talk about the criteria by which LPs can assess GPs, uh, and how does could that help firms that are smaller? Because I'm sure many of these are smaller firms that may not have as robust HR departments. So, so can you speak about how these dynamics come into play in smaller asset managers? I would say LPs are are very quick in these conversations to offer themselves as resources. One of the things that brought me to ILPA was just the incredible generosity of these people <laughs> and how much of their time and ideas and knowledge and networks they give up so freely. And this, I think the same is absolutely true in these conversations with GPs who say, I know I'm not diverse. I don't know what to do. I can't find any diverse talent. And, and I will tell you a number of my members have said, we're not, we're not gonna tolerate that excuse anymore. We're gonna help you. <laughs> we're gonna point you to organizations that we know or we're going to connect you with people who might be able to point you to organizations that would help you dig a little bit deeper in your recruitment efforts. But I, I think the I can't find the talent is not tolerable any longer from an LP's perspective. But that doesn't mean LPs won't tolerate it, nor will they help. They're happy to help. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, so you, why don't we then, I, I, I would suggest we go in reverse order from how we started. So if we start, Donna, with you, uh, if you'd like to take a couple of minutes to, to uh, close with your 
broad thoughts or any any parting messages for our audience? I mean, I think my broad thoughts are you need to, you know, to the extent that you have time, um, you should you should uh, attend events like this, you know, and and really, because you never know where that next great idea is going to come from, where you're going to get that net, next inspiration. It's very, very hard to, to tell. And then, uh, you know, every time you say to yourself, eh, it's not for me, you know, try it, try it. Right. You know, you're never going to have another chance in your life like this to, to try it. And I know there's a lot of pressure to get stuff done. And, to, you know, what am I going to do? And, and a lot of anxiety, perhaps. And well, maybe not anxiety, but uncertainty, uh, which can lead to anxiety around what's going on. Uh, but just have faith. It's all going to work out. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's so funny. I had a speaker in my class the other day and we were talking about SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporations. And the students were all like, this is, oh my God, SPACs. And, and, and the speaker and I are around the same age and we're saying to ourselves, yeah, this is a blank check companies redux. You know, I mean, so, you know, it, a lot of things seem new to you, uh, but they're not. You know, we've been in, we haven't, no, we haven't had a pandemic in a hundred years, but, you know, there are things that 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 repeat, you know, and you can find some people who who've walked the path before you who can help you, you know what I mean, and say, you know, it's really not that bad, or you know what, uh, it's bad, but there's a lot of opportunity. Let me show you where you might look, you know, and and seek out those resources because I fundamentally believe, and I, I know this to be true, haven't been around for a while, that you know people actually want to help you, you know, but you you know let them help you, you know, I mean, one of the best, one of the nicest things is when you know people when when you, when somebody asks me to help them, you know what I mean? And they let me be of service to them, you know? So, um, so try to do that. Let people be of service to you. And also you be of service to others and uh, we'll all get there, you know, and, 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 and it's, and time takes time. You know, I keep having to remind myself of that too. Cause I'm like, you know, I want it done. I want it done yesterday. You know, I want to know the answer, you know, and uh, it doesn't work that way, you know? And so enjoy the trip, you know, enjoy the trip. Um, because it, you'll, you'll be at a destination soon enough. So enjoy enjoy your time getting there. Enjoy the scenery a little bit. So uh, thanks. This was a great panel. Thanks to everybody for being here, everybody on the line, and, and Kathleen, who organized this, and Amar, who I get to get to work with, and uh, Jen, who was on the panel with me last time, and Alyssa, my gosh, she's, she's an amazing... Um, an amazing credit to Columbia Business School, an amazing credit to KKR, and just a and a great colleague and friend. I mean, she steps up anytime we need anything. So thank you all for for giving your time, and I'll pass it on. Thank you, Donna. Alisa, please. Sure. Um, well, I, I'll echo all of what Donna said. I think she hit it spot on. Um, I think what we all need to remember, whether it's on this topic or any topic, is it's about who you work with. It's about the people, right? It's, it's, not, it's not about the what you do. It's about who you do it with, right? Um, and I think one thing that we all have to realize is we all could want to acculturate into different firms and, and change different places that we work, but you gotta like the fundamental culture and you gotta like the people. And I think this is something that, you know, call it two decades ago when I found KKR and they found me, the reason I, I liked them, I chose them versus others that I had offers from some our competitors, it was the who. It was the fact that, yes, I know I was alone, um, that there weren't many women there at all, but what I liked was the culture and the values that they stood for. And I think that is what then led to us doing everything you see us doing today. That wasn't by accident, right? So I, I, I would just say for folks on, on, on the line, you know, one, act as a leader, right? Uh, the company you keep matters. It's a reflection of you. Um, and it really depends, I think, us making, you know, change in this area of the industry. Um, you know, every tidal wave and every tsunami started with a drop. And I think you can't get overwhelmed because I think that's what sometimes happens is, you know, we're so far back, right? Like, how do, how do we advance and, you know, how do we grow that nine that we keep referring to to, 15 and 25 and whatever, whatever other percent we want it, we want it to achieve to or reach, you know, it starts with a drop. It starts with one hire. It starts with one promotion. It, that's where it starts. And if we can build on that, we're going to, we're going to, the industry will take care of itself if we could set that culture and values and the who up the right way. Thank you, Elisa. Jen. I'll just start by saying this isn't a widget business. This is a people business. This is an ideas business. We're connecting 
people and capital and ideas. That's that's what we're about. And you've heard Don and Lisa, you know, hit the drum beat here. This is about people. Um, and if we're gonna if if we're gonna succeed as an industry, as businesses, as individuals, you know, it's really gonna take the best and the brightest. And just one other quick parting thought here is. You know, we often talk about diversity or we talk about DNI. We don't spend a lot of time d going deep on inclusion. And I don't take credit for this quote. I heard it from a wonderful uh, GP in London, but I'll bring it up here. You know, diversity may be about being asked to the dance, but inclusion is being asked to dance when you get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we spend so much time talking about pipeline and recruitment. And it's really, really important that we don't lose sight of culture and values and all the amazing things. And KKR, KKR is a great example of this, but all of the amazing things that you can do, the sky really is the limit. There's no limit to your creativity um, in really making the workplace inclusive, making people embrace the values, show up as their authentic selves at work and bring the, their best selves to the workplace. Well, thank you so much, Jen. And, and you know, we've received so many gems from our panelists that you know I, I'm sure we'll go back on this. And of course, this is being recorded. This will be shared, uh, and we hope this can be a resource to come, and that this really be the beginning of a conversation that can continue. So I, I'm very grateful to our, our esteemed panelists for their insights, for sharing their perspective, and for being so generous uh, with their with their time with us this evening. Uh, and you know. With that, I'll ask you to join me in thanking all of our panelists uh, virtually with a round of applause. Uh, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you further uh, as the Richmond Center and as the private equity program. And thank you again for attending our panel. Have a good night.